Good afternoon. I'm John Lozier. I'm the Executive Director of the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. Pope Paul VI said, if you want peace, work for justice. You're engaged in work for justice, for housing justice, for health care justice. And I thank you so much for that work. I believe that justice is built on community. And I want to take just a moment to celebrate the community that we have built over the years and that this conference represents and to thank all of you for your parts in this great work for peace. Let me uh, just ask you to applaud each other for your work, if you would. <laughs> the address that you'll hear in a couple of minutes is the annual Susan Nybacher address of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council that occurs at this conference. Susan was an early president of the, National, uh, of the National Council and was the founder and executive director of Care for the Homeless in New York City. She led our early work on how homelessness and managed care might or might not interface and really set the tone for the uh, fierce and committed advocacy that characterizes much of the best of healthcare for the homeless work. So we named this annual address after Susan. My job right now is to introduce to you an, another president of the board of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Doreen Fadis has served us for a year uh, as, as our outgoing president, but she is the executive director of the Healthcare for the Homeless program at Mercy Medical Center in Springfield, Mass. She will introduce to you our today's Susan Nybacher speaker and will emcee the rest of this afternoon's program. Doreen. Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you for welcoming everyone here today, and I especially want to thank the City of Portland. What a great turnout that you have accomplished here, having the highest attendance of any Healthcare for the Homeless conference ever. Great hotel, I know it's a little crowded, but great hotel, great food. You did a good job on the weather, so thank you, Portland, very much. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Paul Harkaway. Last fall, I attended a conference. We are colleagues of Trinity Health System on community benefits, and Dr. Harkaway spoke about health care. He talked about health care as it is going, the good that is happening in health care, but he also talked a lot about some of the challenges that we have in health care. When I heard him speak, I went over to someone that some of you may know, Dr. Bashar Shakir, and I said, how do you think he'd be at a Healthcare for the Homeless conference? And he said, I think he'd be great. His presentation was spot on, the work that you do is spot on, and I think it's a perfect match. He's also a pretty funny guy. He can talk about ACOs and clinically integrated networks with humor, and that takes talent. So let me just tell you a little bit about some of his talents. Dr. Harkaway joined Trinity Health in January of 2012 to help lead the efforts around clinical integration and population health management. As senior vice president, Paul was instrumental in the development and construction of Trinity's clinical integrated networks and ACOs. In February of 2016, Dr. Harkaway transitioned from overseeing uh, CINs and ACOs, and his expertise in this field is now being used in setting them up in Michigan. As a talented physician, it makes him a perfect fit for this new role. Also, his work makes it a perfect fit for this group. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Harkaway. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much. I can't tell you how honored it is to be at a gathering like this. I'm blown away, I have to be honest with you. 
seeing some of the sessions and just seeing the magnitude of what you do and the work that you do. I'm also a little nervous, i got to admit it. Um, there's a lot of people here, and plus I understand there's another room somewhere, for God's sake. You know, they talk about public speaking being the number one fear that people have, right? And you think about, well, what's that all about? I mean, some primordial fear. But I saw somebody had described what they thought was the explanation for it. It made a lot of sense to me, quite honestly. So it has to do with predator-prey relationships, right? <laughs> so normally, when you're standing looking and have all these eyes focused on you, you immediately revert back to some wolf pack <laughs> that's about and I think there's truth to that, and seeing you all with a bunch of knives and forks in your hands. <laughs> so I am honored, but I'm, I'm, I'm also uh, humbled, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. So um, you have to have a conflict of interest slide now for every place you speak and everything you do, so I talked to the leadership at Trinity to create one for me, and this is what they came up with. Nothing this man says should ever be construed to represent anyone's opinion other than his own and certainly does not represent ours. So, so I do want to give you that disclosure that I'm pretty much speaking on behalf of myself. You can see I even put a little Che Guevara down in the corner. There. I get in trouble for that too. I have a picture of, of um, a mural with Che painted on the wall. You've probably seen that picture picture and next to it is a homeless person sitting down. Uh, if you've seen that, that's in my office. And I realize Chad took it a little bit too far, right? I acknowledge that. But I also use Chad as a symbolism of physician as um, social advocate for change. So, and um, I know a lot of you in this audience would resonate around that. So um, in honor of the work you do, I wanted to tell you a really brief story and then tie into the work that I've been doing. So I'm in um, Boston. I didn't know that Dr. O'Connell existed at the time or this would have been a different story, but I'm in Boston at some meeting and, and here comes a bunch of ambulances down the street and I was probably away from, a block away from Mass General. I was going to some course there and going to their uh, grand rounds and they scrape this guy off the street and go screaming away, take him up to Mass General, and it just dawned on me, this is many years ago, it just hit me because I'm, I'm an intensive care doc, right? So my, my history is dealing with folks that came in in those circumstances in the ICU side, and we would do our righteous good stuff and really feel proud of ourselves for bringing people back from the brink. But we didn't spend a whole lot of time thinking about or worrying about how they got that way in the first place. And we'd just be prepared to do it all over again when they came back in and again pat ourselves on the back. So it hit me like a ton of bricks that time I was in Boston that this guy was going to go to Mass General and get exquisite care second to none. But the circumstances that got him there probably wouldn't change and he'd be right back. And that's your guys work and I can't tell you, well, again, what an honor it is to be able to work with a group of people who dedicate themselves to that part of the work instead of the kind of high-tech razzmatazz that we do. So having said that, I want to I focus on the work that we've been doing around building ACOs and the why behind that. And one could argue that this isn't very related to your work, but I'd argue just the opposite. And one of the efforts that we've had, and Bashar has been key in this as well, is to try to connect between acute care, ambulatory care, and, and the community-based resources, as opposed to all the silos that we've traditionally had that never the twain shall meet. So let me talk a little bit about healthcare in this country now and why we need to do what we're doing. This is a concept I stole from Otis Brawley, if you know him. We spend $3 trillion a year on healthcare in this country, $3 trillion, and it doesn't seem like a big number, and the reason is because you're desensitized to what a trillion is. So Otis used this concept to explain how big a number a trillion is. So turning it to seconds instead of dollars, a million seconds ago was 12 days. And, and I bet if you work at it and you get your spouse to help you, you can remember what you were doing 12 days ago. Some of you, maybe not so much. A billion seconds ago is 32 years, and looking around the audience, there are several of you here 
who would be able to potentially remember what they did 32 years from ago. Some of you might need your parents to help you recall that, or your spouse. So that's a billion seconds. A trillion seconds is 30,000 BC. Even John, who's been at this this long, <laughs> has no recollection of 30,000 BC. So the point is that three trillion dollars is a lot of money. And we know that we don't get what we pay for, right? So this slide just demonstrates, as is often the case, on the, in the light blue rectangles is life expectancy, and in the dark purple line is, is spend on health care. And you can see that life expectancy declines when you go left to right, and then there's a blip in spend, and that's us, the United States. But this isn't my favorite slide. This one is. Statisticians in the group, there's got to be a couple, right? Anybody into statistics? Anybody take statistics? Thank you. <laughs> So this is a correlation, and there's actually decent correlation between what you spend on health care and life expectancy, striking it in a way, but we get to bugger up the correlation coefficient. This guy had a great paper going, had an R square of 0.51, but way out there stands us and what we spend versus life expectancy. So we even get the opportunity to screw up somebody's correlation coefficient. This is the Commonwealth Fund. I stopped making this slide because it was the same every year. I never had to change the slide, so I decided to save the electrons, right? But overall healthcare ranking, international study every year compares 11 nations on healthcare quality, access, efficiency, equity, as well as indicators of healthy life, such as infant mortality. And we're always last for the industrialized countries, right? So you guys know all this, right? So this is supposedly the good part of our healthcare system, right? The part that we've invested so much resources in doesn't perform very well. This leads me to what's known as Stein's Law. This is Herbert Stein. Herbert Stein is Ben Stein's father, okay? Do you all know who Ben Stein is? Can somebody do it for me, please? Bueller, anyone? Class, yeah. By the way, I have yet to talk to any audience of any size who doesn't know about Ferris Bueller's um, day off. I want to go to Madagascar someday and give this talk and see if they know about Ben Stein and Ferris Bueller's day off. And it's because all of life's lessons are in Caddyshack, Ferris Bueller's day off, and maybe Pulp Fiction, depending on how weird you are. Yeah, so Herbert Stein was an economist in the Nixon administration and he quoted what's known as Stein's Law, which is the only thing I'm gonna say that you should write down, okay? Stein's Law, if something cannot go on forever, it will stop. Three trillion dollars for basically low quality care has to stop and will. And that's not even the whole story, right? There's also the experience of care. So you have a story, and if we had time, I could tell you about my 88 year old mother who has, doesn't have serious health problems, but has health problems. And I could tell you one story after another with her experience with the healthcare system. And some of them would be good or they have good elements in them, but overall it'd be an exercise in frustration. And every one of you have a story too, right? So the experience of care is an issue. And if that's not enough, this is from 2004, which was um, based on my uh, calculator, my iPhone was 12 years ago. It's not easy to return to the clinic after a time away. The ills that afflict modern medicine seem magnifying by distance. With each passing year, I feel a little less like the caring doctor I once envisioned and more like a salmon running upstream, butting against powerful currents flowing swiftly in the wrong direction. 2004. And we know physician and nurse burnout is getting worse, right? Now, how many docs here? Do not feel sorry for us, please. I know your natural tendency is 
oh, the poor doctors, right? <laughs> Everybody always said, that, oh, you're a doctor. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> your, your life is so, so much of a burden, right? <laughs> I, try, I talk to physicians a lot. I try to convince them that I realize they're burned out and they feel like they're victims, but nobody feels sorry for them, right? <laughs> anyway. But it's a serious issue, right? Because if your doctor is burned out, not likely to be very empathetic with you, and probably is a much higher likelihood of making a mistake. So all of this is just to say that we've got sort of this perfect storm in healthcare right now, the work that you guys do and the work that we're trying to do on the, more on the provider side. And again, it's either opportunity or it's misery, right? And I would say it's tremendous opportunity. In fact, I would say it's a tremendous responsibility those of us in healthcare now have obligation. And the point of this slide is it's not, when I was in, working in the ICU taking care of one of those folks that came in, I like to believe I wasn't providing this grade D level care. And I don't think I was. But it's a system issue, right? So when Gandhi went to London, and actually before he went to the British Parliament, he went through some of the um, less desirable neighborhoods in London and he saw the blight, right? And when he was walking up the steps of the uh, parliament, the British press asked him, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he said, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> what do you think of the healthcare system we have in this country? It would be a good idea. We don't have one. And that's what we're trying to create. So go on a little journey f with me here for a minute. And let's just own it, just for the rest of your lunch. Let's just own that we created the problem. We were in healthcare and have been in healthcare when this came up. Anybody here who does not care about children, either your own or somebody else's? <laughs> Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> I know you're out there. Maybe it's the lights I can't see. Okay, so I'm gonna presume you care about your children or somebody else's children. Well, if we don't do something different with healthcare, we're just passing it on to our kids. It's the equivalent of the, I believe, Native American, although people have argued where this quote came, came from concept environmentalism. We did not inherit the earth from our fathers. We are borrowing it from our children, right? I was just reading about the, the Olympics in uh, summer Olympics coming up and they're having trouble with the sailing races because there's so much garbage in the water. They're getting stuck on plastic bags and stuff like that. Oh my God, that's what we're leaving to our children. So it's the same in healthcare. If we don't do something different, either we're gonna land them with the insurmountable debt, the current national debt is $20 trillion. While you're sitting here in this conference, it went up by six billion. I already told you how big a numbers these are, right? And a big piece of that is healthcare. Or we just don't allow them to get access to healthcare and let them pay for themselves, in which case by 2020, the average health premium for a family of four would be $40,000 just to afford the premium. Or we do some of the things we're already doing, which is creating vehicles for folks to get health insurance, but they have a $10,000 deductible. Some states, the exchange rates will go up by 60% next year, right? So I'd argue if you have a $10,000 deductible, you're not, you're, you have an access to care problem. Not like a lot of the folks you work with, but you've got an access to care problem, and you're not gonna get your health care needs met. So we have to do something about this. And we have to do something for our patients. So let's just own it for just for lunch. It's our mess. We created it. We own this, 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 and we cannot escape history because we are here in the healthcare field during the great healthcare transformation of 2016 to 2025, or however long it's going to take. So, what do we do? Well, I quote Berwick on this. I'm a Berwick fan. Any other Berwick fans out there? Amen, right? I wish he was still there, but we won't talk about that right now. 
So Berwick described ACOs, but interestingly, nobody really had picked up on the concept he articulated. Everybody's rushed to talking about the financing of these things and how we're going to keep everybody whole. Guess what? We're not going to keep everybody whole and, and reduce the $3 trillion debt. So here's Berwick's definition of an ACO. And this is what we've tried to construct in, in our role at uh, Trinity and now in Michigan. An ACO is just a charismatic term. What we all need is a steward for today's hugely complex medical systems. ACOs are inventive forms of care with common characteristics, not a financing organization. A care organization with patients and families at the center. ACOs will have memory about patients, not amnesia, will attend to handoffs, manage resources, reduce waste, invest where it counts, reduce dependence on hospitals, be proactive, track outcomes, and continuously improve. Find a flaw in that for me, would you? And so when I preach about building ACOs, I say just build that, just do that. All of those components, by the way, are relatively easily measured. There is one problem for us in the healthcare business though, and that's the infamous two-curve model. You guys familiar with this? Ian Morrison described this in the 90s during the managed care heydays, right? On the left, the blue curve is traditional fee-for-service. The more I do, the more I make. A CAT scan is a source of revenue. On the red is population health curve, where a CAT scan is cost, right? So they're photographic negatives of each other, two-curve model. And it's very similar to what Clayton Christian described as an innovator's dilemma, right? Because in order to do well on the second curve, you do it at the expense of the first curve, right? So, several examples of that from my hometown of Detroit. Anybody from Detroit? Yeah. <laughs> yes, Detroit's coming back. <laughs> but we would have at least two bankrupt auto companies if we didn't get bailed out because of the two curve, right? Detroit said, we can't make those small cars that go beep, beep because it'll erode into our profit margins with the big trucks and SUVs and stuff like that. So we'll just keep making the big ones where the money is. And what happened is somebody else came in and made small cars that go beep, beep, and uh, nearly bankrupted us if you all hadn't bailed us out, and thanks for that. Here's another example, right? Kodak, gone, doesn't exist anymore. I was at a place not long ago that has a Kodak moment, right? It's like, <laughs> you probably ought to take that sign down. <laughs> Just saying. Kodak made great film. They want to keep making film. Digital imaging was invented at Kodak and yet they couldn't get over to that other curve. In fact, the history for companies that have to get from one curve to the other is not very good, and that's exactly what we have to do in healthcare. And there's a visceral side of this that doesn't come out when you just describe the two curve model. So I have one slide for Doreen, really, I did this. <laughs> that gives you more of a visceral sense of what it's like to be on the front lines when those two curves are crashing into each other. <laughs> How long would you like me to dwell on this slide, folks? <laughs> That's what it feels like, okay? In fact, I felt so strongly that this was an image of what we're going through in healthcare right now that I suggested to the leadership of Trinity that this should be our new logo. That was soundly rejected, and I'm still kind of hurt about that, to be honest with you. And the easiest way to, to, to get at this uh, overwrought cost that we have is just drive out the waste. Current estimates are a third of what we do is waste, and nobody that I talk to on the front lines in healthcare argues that. One third, one trillion dollars, right? 30,000 BC, waste, waste, right? except for that waste is somebody else's profit, right? My Uncle Dan, when he moved up to northern Michigan and took all his kids with him and 
uh, didn't have a job, left his job, because he wanted to be in northern Michigan, it's beautiful. Anybody from northern Michigan? Yeah, nobody lives there. <laughs> okay, one more, yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful up there. So he started the trash route, and I, every time you'd ask him, Uncle Dan, how's it going? He'd say, well, it's picking up. <laughs> hey, true story. Anyway, so he was making money on some, so there are people that make money on the waste now, and they're going to feel very threatened. So that two-curve model makes it extremely challenging. For those who say, didn't we do this already in the 90s, the answer is sort of with managed care, which is where I cut my teeth on this and got it in my blood, by the way, managed care in the Eindhoven model uh, was a better way to take care of patients without question, and I saw that and got excited about it, which is why I'm still doing this now. But we bastardized it into something else and kind of uh, took it off the rails, right? But the difference is shown on the uh, slide with Uncle Sam here, if I can get that back. And that's this time the feds are in it big time, for better, for worse, to be honest. On any given day, CMS was driving us a little bit crazy right now, but they understand Stein's law too, right? And that's a big difference from the, from the 90s when we did this. And as you know, the HHS, um, Burwell et al. have declared that uh, by the end of this year, 30% of revenues going into healthcare have to be tied to value including total cost of care. They've already exceeded that, by the way. And she and CMS have the, have, uh, the industry aligned as well in 50% by 2018, and I have no doubt that they'll get there, right? So this one, this train is not gonna stop. For better, for worse, I'd say largely for better because of Stein's law, right? But there's also issues that come out of trying to manage with some of the things that CMS is coming up with. I do believe in a single payer system. I'll bet you, a lot of you guys do too. I'm just not sure who it should be. That's my problem. So I'm gonna nominate John for that in his retirement to set up a single payer system. We'll put on here. No, I, I mean, we have to get there, right? You're not gonna get rid of the waste with these multiple different payers with different avenues and with the tremendous profits associated with the insurance side of the industry. So, join me in acknowledging that we were around when this all developed and we own fixing it on behalf of our kids and our patients. When I talk to providers, I get a lot of yeah buts, right? Yeah, but what about malpractice? And yeah, but what about you know, the patient at end of life who insists on additional chemotherapy even though nothing's gonna work. And, and um, if you focus on the yeah buts, you never get anywhere, right? So join me in trying to modify this system on behalf of our, our uh, children and our patients. Understand that we can't escape history. Understand that we can't continue to function in silos on my side of the fence nor on your side of the fence. We've got to integrate care, community-based integration of care. And recognize too that Salman Young predicted that the timid never would never start and the weak would die along the way. This is really, really hard work, but very worthwhile. And I personally am greatly appreciative of the work that you guys do. Thank you. There is absolutely no way I'm going to jump up on that ramp and trip and fall in front of all of you, so <laughs> sorry it took so long to walk up here. Thank you so much. I truly look at you as a national leader in this model, and I truly look at the people out here as national leaders, and I'm so happy that the two have met, and I encourage you to go to your communities and find your Dr. Paul Harkaway and blend the acute care world with you work with your world on a greater level, and thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, it gives me a great honor to introduce Pooja Bala from the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. 
who is going to introduce the Karen Rotundo Award. Pooja. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I'm here on behalf of the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council and the Clinicians Network to give away the 2016 Karen Rotundo Award. So let me take a minute to tell you about the Clinicians Network and then I'll tell you more about the award. The Clinicians Network, um, Healthcare for the Homeless Clinicians Network is the nation's leading membership group that connects hands-on providers from many disciplines who are committed to improving the health and quality of life of people experiencing homelessness. It also provides a forum for its members to share the latest information and research, review, and make recommendations about clinical practice and network with peers. And membership is free. Any of you can actually go on to the website and sign up for it. And it's a yearly tradition that we give away the Karen Rotondo Award for the outstanding service. I did not know Karen personally, but in the years that I've been involved, have heard lots of wonderful stories um, about Karen. So telling you a little bit about Karen, the Clinicians Network Annual Award for Outstanding Service honors the memory and legacy of Karen Rotondo, who was the RN, the founding mother of the HCH Clinicians Network. It's awarded to one of the exemplary clinicians in the homeless healthcare field every year. It also recognizes hands-on caregivers who demonstrate vision and creativity in advancing the goals of ending and preventing homelessness and who have made a significant contribution to improving the health and quality of life of people experiencing homelessness. So now I get to announce the winner of this year, which is Dr. Elizabeth Salisbury, who's here from... <laughs> it's nice to have her up here as we talk about her. Dr. Salisbury is the medical director at Heartland Health Outreach in Chicago, where she's created new programs addressing addiction, initiated multidisciplinary teams to care for Heartland's highest acuity patients, and collaborated with other organizations to address community health challenges. Dr. Salisbury's demonstrated commitment to providing health outcomes on the patients she serves with an eye to addressing the large-scale issues surrounding homelessness. Several colleagues sent in notes um, for this award, and I'll read some of them here. Um, she's enacted a Suboxone program, identified a community health need that desperately needed to be addressed, and created a program from the ground up that identifies and addresses the difficulties and inadequacies of systems that help those suffering the opiate addiction. She's also been instrumental in the initiation of a program that provides care to the patients seen at Heartland Health, who are of the highest acuity. The team called Team Tahoe involves a multidisciplinary approach to care. Early outcomes show that these participants have, decrease, have decreased the use of emergency rooms as their primary source of medical care. They're also getting more quickly connected to housing, case management, and mental health resources. They've seen improvements in med adherence, mental illness stabilization, and ease of connections to higher levels of care. Some of the other colleagues have also described Dr. Salisbury as an inspiration and a role model for her employees and peers. She works tirelessly to help streamline workflows, improve employee satisfaction, improve health outcomes for our patients. She's smart and confident, yet very humble. Her diligence and commitment to helping the homeless is unmatched. Even in an extremely dynamic healthcare system, she continues to meet goals and motivate her staff to meet their goals as well. She's a true advocate for her employees and her patients. So without further ado, let's give her another round of applause for this well-deserved honor. I will be very brief. Um, before coming up here, I was just telling the team 
my boss asked me, are you excited? And I said, I don't know if excited is the right word. It's more honored. Um, I feel like everyone in this room deserves this award. I just happen to have worked with, be lucky enough to work with a team who um, applied, I guess, on my behalf. Um, it is a very humbling experience every year to come here and to hear about the work everyone's doing. Um, I really, I feel like all of us deserve this, so I'm here just sort of, I guess, on behalf of my team and on behalf of all of you to thank everyone for the work that we're doing um, and the tireless sort of commitment that we all have to the populations we serve. So thank you. Thank you, and congratulations again. And uh, Pooja, thank you again for that wonderful introduction. And um, I realize I introduced you incorrectly. It's Dr. Pooja Bala. So congratulations on this new achievement in your life. Um, if I can ask uh, my colleagues to join me. Oh, they're over there. Okay. Um, Barbara Kananen and Marianne Savarees are going to assist in giving the Phil Brickner Award today. It is blinding, yeah. Okay, good, so I can't see you, but you can see me. I was already warned this morning that I, I am tangential in speech, so let me just get that out of the way. Thank you, Barry. I, I, thank you, Barry. Let, let me get the tangent out of the way and get right to the point. St. Vincent's Hospital, Department of Community Medicine. Dr. Philip W. Brickner was our chair. I spent about 20 years there with him, and it was a very dynamic place. Community medicine was the core. I mean, that was the word. You know, community um, is the operant word there, where the idea was to bring the healthcare system to those who needed it the most. And Dr. Brickner had a couple of heroes. He had many heroes, but a couple of heroes to note. Lillian Wald was a public health nurse who visited TB patients down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan at the Henry Street uh, Settlement was her, her um, place of uh, business. And so she connected housing and uh, poor conditions in the TB epidemic um, into one focus of need and Dr. Brickner was really moved by that and she was one of his heroes. Another hero was Hal Strelnick at Montefiore, the Department of uh, Community and Social Medicine. Um, they actually sort of taught us what to do at the beginning, or Dr. Brickner was a, um, a great fan of Hal Strelnick. And we would uh, travel up there to the Bronx and learn things and try to create uh, systems of care that were similar. Systems of care that included the team approach, right? Doctor, nurse, social worker teams. Outreach medicine, which is what we're all doing here, and connecting those to the uh, biopsychosocial uh, and um, social determinants of health. It was very progressive for the time. It was a long time ago. The Department of Community Medicine started in the 60s. I started working there in the 70s. I was very young. <laughs> I really was very young, but it was a wonderful opportunity. And um, it was a dynamic place filled with students, students of nursing and social work, and we had a primary care residency program, and lots of people flocked to work there because Dr. Brickner was such a selfless, and a selfless leader who avoided recognition and credit, and he was all about teaching and learning and sharing. So that's what we did, and we learned by doing. We learned what to do, how to do it, because it was the right thing to do, and we just put one step in front of the other and surged forward. But, and among our staff were lots of physicians, uh, like Ivy League type physicians with plaid shirts and ties and jeans. There were a lot of us, uh, a lot of them. I'm a nurse, I'm not a physician. There were a lot of them, and they were wonderful, selfless people, just like Dr. Brickner. And, uh, and it was really a dynamic place. I'm, I feel so fortunate to have worked there. And then fast forward a few years, in the 80s, we were chosen because of our model. We were chosen to 
administer the Robert Wood Johnson Demonstration Project, setting all of you guys up. Dr. Bruckner would be so proud and amazed to see all of you in this room and then to know about all of your other colleagues back home at the programs that you're uh, affiliated with. He would be amazed. He would want no credit and he would be amazed. And so I was on one of the, I was on the team to administer the grant. We would travel around to cities and one of our cities was Boston. The city of Boston was going to set up a homeless health care program, okay, associated with the Pine Street Inn, you know, so we all traveled up there and Dr. Brickner was crazy, you know, he, he, he had to be three hours early and we'd run through terminals and get on planes and we couldn't stay overnight, we had to go to Boston just for the day on a plane. And there we were, we went into the site visit room, we started the visit and there was this doctor with a plaid shirt and a tie and jeans. And it was like perfect. I'm here to tell you that it was love at first sight. All of you have taken the baton and the model of HCH program, but it was there that I actually witnessed Dr. Brickner. It was love at first sight, sight for our award recipient. And uh, there I, I, I saw the baton passing and it really has come such a long way since then. Barbara will elaborate if I haven't said enough already. Thank you, my colleague. I really don't have to do my speech now. I, will, I would like to say good afternoon. I am amazed and inspired to see so many people in this movement. My name is Dr. My, my name is Barbara Kananen, and I'm a nurse by training. And I've worked with Dr. Brickner for 35 years. And yes, I started when I was five. <laughs> he was humble, brilliant, steadfast in his convictions, kind, and he had a great sense of humor. Uh, we used to have weekly staff meetings, and he would always tell a joke at the beginning of the meeting. And we all laughed, even though we heard this joke every week. <laughs> he was my mentor, my teacher, and of course, my boss. However, he always referred to us as the team, to the team as his colleague, to me as his colleague. He promoted that sense of community. He nudged you to grow, and sometimes he push you to grow. And that was a great, great gift. He was a man of extraordinary vision, leadership, and humanity. As Marion said, he wanted to do the right thing for mankind. She, she spoke about the team approach. Two things I want to emphasize. He, it was a patient-centered approach. It was all about patient care. The other thing he wanted to provide compassionate and dignified healthcare services. So those are p pieces I would like to add to Marianne's piece. Dr. Brickner, lifelong passion and innovations in healthcare introduced to you guys, socially significant career pathways for thousands of professionals. Maybe some tidbits you do not know. He also created a program for the homebound elderly so they could stay at their home and not go to nursing homes. He also created a program to train primary care residents, and several of them are in this audience today. So I would like to, I want to, and I need to thank the Board of Directors of the National Health Care for the Homeless Council for establishing the first Philip W. Brickner National Leadership Award in his honor. I would like to read two emails. Initially, I wrote letters. I said, they don't do letters anymore, emails. <laughs> that came in about the recipient. One is from Dr. Brickman's wife. Her name is Alice. Dear Jim, I am very happy to hear that you will be the inaugural honoree of the Philip W. Brickman National Leadership Award. Phil, as she loved, um, and we all love to say, will be delighted. 
As you surely know, he had a great affection for you and also high respect and admiration for your work. I send warmest congratulations to you and to the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council. Giving you this award sets a high mark for future honorees. Much love to you and high hopes for future endeavors. One other um, email I would like to read comes from a colleague that worked with Dr. Brigner the latter part of his career. His name was Richard Benson. Dr. Brigner was really, really focused on eliminating tuberculosis in New York City, across the nation, as well um, in, um, in internationally. And, and Richard said, Dr. Brigner maintained a regular cycle of life, time for friends, family, and grandchildren. Jim was a special part of this cycle. He was a kindred spirit. Looking through an old appointment book, remember those? From 2010, show May and November dates for lunch in the village. I'm sure if I could look back at those day timers, those appointment books, <laughs> there would be a lot more appointments. I'm glad Jim is continuing his work with providing care to such, care to the sick poor, a living tribute to Dr. Brooklyn legacy. Congratulations, Jim, on being the first Philip W. Brickman Award recipient from the National Health Care for the Homeless Council. I just said to Jim, we're not done. <laughs> Portland, besides having the largest uh, audience, I think you are actually the most polite. You could hear a pin drop. And we thought it was very important that you understand Phil Brickner because some of you know him. Most of you are never going to experience him, but each one of you, we have a little, I have a theme here with shoes, and you are all walking in his shoes. Whether you were the very nice case manager I spoke to in Marin County this morning, the consumer I spoke to a couple of nights ago, the MP or doctor, you are walking in his shoes. So we wanted to take the time to lay that out for you, just to hear it and to grasp it. So now this is the official start, Jim. <laughs> And I know um, Dr. Jim O'Connell is a very humble person, and I know this makes him a little uncomfortable, but I can guarantee introducing you has not been the most comfortable thing in my life either. I didn't even know where to start. Dr. Jim O'Connell's curriculum vitae represents his 30 years of service. It's 22 pages long, and I read every page, and I put it into a little synopsis that I want to share with you. He's attended three universities, Notre Dame, Cambridge, and Harvard. 42 is a number that represents local boards, regional boards, and national boards that he has sat on either in the past or present. He has been honored and received awards 31 times. He has done over 144 presentations. He has been one guest of the White House, President Barack Obama's administration, to discuss the ACA. He has done 78 publications, abstracts, and posters. He has one great partner, Jill, and he has one very cool dad to his daughter, Gabriella. He's a role model for all of us that have shared some of those 30 years with him, but he's a role model for many of you who are just starting out in the service that we are all participating in. Barry Bach described him, the CEO of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, have, of having a unique gift of setting his patients at ease. And Dr. Howard Cove, the former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services, says he's a historic pioneer and a witness to the human vulnerability. His work is firmly grounded in street outreach and reaches the various high, highest levels of health policy decisions in our country. Everywhere he goes, he exudes the compassion, patient, and humble confidence that make him a great street doctor, a superb clinical leader, and a great advocate. Jim is all of that, and to read his book, Story from the Shadows, is to learn about the patient-centeredness in the truest form and to encounter all the issues 
that make HCH both necessary and special. At every turn, the influence of Jim's keen intellect and strong values have shaped the world for all of us. Phil Brickner recognized Jim O'Connell's fine qualities, his leadership, and the two were personally quite close. So this is the end, Jim. Good. Phew. It is my honor and it is my privilege on behalf of the Board of Directors of the National Healthcare for the Homeless um, to offer to Jim, Dr. Jim O'Connell, the first Philip W. Brickner National Leadership Award. Please join in congratulating. So thank you very much. That was acutely embarrassing, <laughs> except, except for the fact that it's all about Dr. Brickner. And um, I'm gonna only speak for a minute here, but I wanted to just share with those of you who did not know Dr. Brickner, um, and these guys were very much too humble to say what they were all about. But he, um, in 1969, okay, and think of what was going on in the world in 1969, was an intern at uh, St. Vincent's, and they started seeing tons and tons of people coming in dead on arrival. And he started to realize that many of them were coming from the same address in uh, Greenwich Village, 160 Bleecker Street. So he um, got a colleague of his, another intern, and they decided to find out what was going on there. And he went to this, what turned out to be an SRO at 160 Bleecker Street, where there were 1,200 men living in, a, you know, in a single building with eight floors. Um, they were all open rooms, and each man had a cubicle that was six by eight that had cinder block going up six feet and then chicken wire going from there up to the ceiling. And they all lived there and then shared bathrooms. And 200 of them were elderly pensioners, people who were very old, and that's where they were living until they died. Um, and the other were a mix of all the people that we were taking care of. So they started doing a clinic three days a week, the doctors at St. Vincent's with the nurses, and one of the things that Dr. Brickner was so insistent about in everything, if you read what he's written or ever talked about, his life was led by nurses. And so the, for those of you who are the nurses out there, healthcare for the homeless is really, was really done and taught to us by the nurses. And to those of you who had done that, thank you. Um, <laughs> So the rest is kind of his. So he was doing this beginning in 1969. He's also the first doctor, really, who sort of sees geriatrics as a specialty. And one of the things that he did that was really special was he did home visits. And I often think now, since so many of us are now learning that going from the streets and the shelters into housing is kind of what he was doing back in 1969 to 1972. And then, of course, uh, you know, my... Uh, you know, I stand here having had the best job in the world for 31 years, and it's all because of him and because of all of you at St. Vincent's Hospital who taught us that this is what we should be doing. And, and also, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for letting us all start. So just to give you that background, we, he is a man who um, I grew to cherish. He was a wonderful mentor. Um, right up into the time he died, he would send these kind of cursive emails, um, often zingers, like, you know, chastising me for not having written the book that I should have written 10 years ago. You know, all the stuff that we should have done. Um, and he never looked at death. He always looked at life. And he didn't ever acknowledge, I mean, he was sick. He would say, I'm just worried about pain control. But he just kept looking ahead. It was really remarkable. And that just before, I'm going to read you one thing that he sent just before he died, um, because it was very powerful for me. He said, he, um, by the way, he sent me uh, a book that I had to read, and he had done a review on the life of Dr. Um, Eugene Stead, and I couldn't figure out why he had said that. It turned out Dr. Stead was the chief of medicine at Duke who founded the PA profession, so for any of you who are PAs here, Dr. Brickner was thrilled with the coming of the PA profession, which, as you know, is one of the few professions in our uh, community that was dedicated to working only in teams, which is what he believed we should all be doing. 
Um, so to the PAs, that was great. But anyway, he sent me a poem. He said, you should read this poem. It was his favorite poem. It's called Two Tramps in Mud Time. Have you ever read that? Um, but anyway, it's a Robert Frost poem. And let me just read you this and end with this because it just summarizes for me what he was all about. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation as my two eyes make one in sight. Only where love and need are one and the work is play for mortal's sake is a deed ever done. Um, and I keep thinking with Dr. Brickner, he had this unique way of making everything he did fun, intense, excellent, but it was, as he would say, we do this because we have to. And I think all of us are here because we have to. And I would just want to accept this award now on behalf of a firm. You know, when I look at Barbara and Marianne and Bill Visick and uh, John McAdam and all the people working so hard at this when we all started, thank you to all of you. And a huge thanks to Dr. Brickner. And he's someone that I think we should all keep in our minds as someone who is here spiritually today and would keep us going. So thank you. It's a great honor to have this. <laughs> Jim is someone who we certainly will all keep in our mind. Thank you, Jim, and congratulations. A few quick announcements. Jim's book, Stories from the Shadows, uh, will be on sale again from uh, the end of this meeting till 2.30, I think, in the, outside the Pavilion Ballroom. Uh, don't forget today's rally. We're leaving from the lobby of the hotel at 4.20 to call for justice in health care and in housing. Uh, tonight in this room, Paula Poundstone will be entertaining us at 8 o'clock. Those of you from Portland, bring your friends. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Um, and finally, if Eowyn is in the room, I'd need to see her up front for, for just a minute. Thank you all very much. Go forth, do good, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>